technologist or a mathematician. I didn't have any uh, real life role models that I knew and interacted with. But uh, I asked my parents to subscribe me to magazines. Uh, I subscribed to Popular Science, Popular Mechanics, and all the magazines for kids. And there I got to read about a lot of cool people out there doing cool, awesome things that I also wanted to do when I grew up. Uh, but besides these real life role models, I also had role models uh, from TV. So one particular series that I love is the James Bond series. I love James Bond, uh, the secret, super secret spy agent man, 007. But another character I loved in James Bond was Q. Q, the quartermaster, who was in charge of the research and development agency for the department for their agency. So Q built all of the cool gadgets, widgets, cars, motorcycles, pens that James Bond had. So uh, when I grew up, I wanted to be more like Q. So I set about on a road to become Q when I grew up. So in middle school, like a lot of you are, today I took shop class and got to design and build a lot of really cool things uh, and work with wood when I was really young. And that was a lot of fun. And I wanted more. So when I got to high school, I took all the science, all the math classes that were offered that I could get uh, access to. And I joined all the clubs, uh, the robotics club, the math club, the science club. I took advantage of every opportunity I had to get my hands dirty uh, doing science and engineering. And when I got old enough to get a job, uh, I got a job at the local mechanic shop, uh, just uh, working around the shop, helping out, uh, learning from the mechanics in the shop was a lot of fun. The summer after that, I got a job at the electronics shop in our town and learned to repair all kinds of electronics devices, repair TVs, finally learned to repair these VCRs that I spent my childhood taking apart. And then another summer after that, I got a job at Pep Boys uh, selling auto parts and helping my customers when they come in, diagnose the problem with their car and find the right part uh, to help them fix it. And those are some of the things I did at your age to get on this road towards becoming an engineer. So, so far, I've told you I was a flight test engineer. I told you what it is that we do uh, in engineering, uh, how I became an engineer, why I became an engineer. And now I'll tell you about some of the cool things I've done as an engineer. Uh, and I'll start with some of the things I did before getting here to uh, the Holy Grail, the Mecca of flight tests, the center of the aerospace testing universe, Edwards Air Force Base. So I've been an engineer for about eight years now. And I started out at the Air Force Research Laboratory working on the hardware and the software for all of our computer systems and cyber systems. And that was a lot of fun because we applied the things I learned in engineering school uh, to building more secure computer systems and cyber systems, but also looking at uh, hacking uh, computer systems, but also airplanes. And that was a lot of fun, learning to be a hacker. Uh, Another cool job I had uh, was a deployment I did with a prototype UAV that the Air Force Research Lab built. So UAV, you'll hear me use this term many times in uh, my talk here. Uh, what does UAV stand for? Some of you may know. Uh, it's an unmanned aerial vehicle. Sometimes you're, you'll hear UAS, unmanned aerial system, which very simply means it's a drone, it's an airplane without a pilot inside of it. So I got to deploy uh, to Afghanistan with this prototype UAV that uh, we built uh, uh, for our special forces operators. So I got to deploy with our Navy SEALs, with our Army Rangers, Green Berets, Red Berets, our Air Force uh, JTACs, Air Force Combat Controllers, Special Tactics Operators, Combat Rescue Operators, and I finally got to be Q to our very own James Bond. And that was an awesome, awesome, awesome job, awesome experience. Uh, before that, uh, I worked on ADSB, which you'll hear about today uh, from your instructors talking about Smart Sky, the next generation air traffic control system. And ADSB is this really cool system that we just implemented this year, 2020, on all of our airplanes flying all over the country where they beacon out their positions. So it is a system where pretty much airplanes are playing Marco Polo all the way from departure, all the way to their destinations uh, to uh, find out where each other are. And that was a really cool system to work on. 
And then after all those cool experiences, I made my way here to Edwards Air Force Base, uh, your very own backyard, the center of the aerospace testing universe. And I've gotten to work on some really awesome projects here in my two years here. And I'll tell you about three of them. So I'll tell you about Orange Flag. I'll tell you about some of my work on flight testing uh, autonomous aircraft. And then I'll tell you about some of my work uh, on counter UAV systems. Orange flag is this uh, large exercise that we do every three or four months uh, where uh, we bring together, and we just did one two weeks ago, where we brought together 30 aircraft, 30 different aircraft, to do compatibility and interoperability testing. So I just used two big words, compatibility and interoperability. What does that mean? Well. Uh, very simply, if you look around your house, you probably have a number of devices. So you probably have the computer on which you're watching me speak right now. Uh, you have your iPads, you have your phones, you have your TVs, and uh, they all work incredibly on their own. And they all probably came from a user manual that I told you earlier, a test engineer wrote by doing test evaluation that tells you exactly how to operate that one system. But uh, sometimes you may want to put them together. You may want to connect them. And you may find out that's not as straightforward as uh, it should be uh, because they all have different input ports and output ports. Some may have VGA, some may have HDMI, some may have uh, USB-C, mini USB, Lightning. There are all these different ports that they have that doesn't make it straightforward to connect them. And that is the same with our airplanes uh, where when we try to make our F-16s talk to our F-18s, talk to our F-22s, F-35s, U-2s, our satellites, our ships, our ground systems, it doesn't always go uh, exactly as it should. So that's why we do compatibility and interoperability testing to learn how to make them talk to each other better and how to do work together better in teams because that's how we accomplish our mission, teamwork. Next, I'll tell you about some of the cool work I've done on testing autonomous aircraft. So autonomy, what is autonomy? It is very simply a machine doing a task or a job by itself without human intervention. And you're starting to see autonomy uh, in all parts of our lives, particularly in cars. So your parents may have a car that has something called adaptive cruise control. And adaptive cruise control is when uh, you tell the car, hey, I want you to go this speed. And the car adjusts based on the traffic condition around it, whether to accelerate or decelerate, it finds the way to do the job on its own. Uh, that's one level of autonomy. A higher level of autonomy is uh, maybe when you have the adaptive cruise control going and then you also have your lane keeping technology where your car will turn the wheel left or right as much as it needs to to follow the road as it bends and curves around. An even higher level of autonomy uh, you're starting to see in a lot of cars, uh, particularly the Tesla cars, are uh, systems of autonomy that are going, levels of autonomy that are going towards fully self-driving vehicles. And uh, we are on our way there in cars, and we, the Air Force, want that autonomy on our airplanes. Uh, we want that autonomy because it relieves our pilots of some of uh, the tedious or, or uh, simpler tasks of the mission so that they can focus their brain energy on the harder, more complex task of the mission. So we're doing that, but you may think, hey, this is uh, a little risky. Things may go wrong, right, Richard? Yeah, exactly. Things may go wrong. And that is why we practice risk management. And that is something we do very well here at the Air Force Test Center, uh, managing risk and making sure things don't go wrong. So we do that in flight tests by using an approach called a build-up approach. And that is you start uh, small or simple before working your way to large and complicated. And for testing autonomy on our airplanes, we're doing that exactly by starting our testing of autonomy on small 20-pound drones or UAVs, as I explained to you earlier, before moving on to 50-pound drones, and then moving on to 1,000-pound, then 10,000-pound, and then finally, we're going to put it on an airplane with a man in it. And that is how we're doing our flight testing of autonomous aircraft here. Now, the last thing I want to tell you about before I open it up for questions is uh, talking about the work I've gotten to do on counter UAV. So UAVs are drones, and uh, there are some that are very small that are you can buy a Best Buy that are cool toys. And you may think, that is an awesome toy. It does really cool things. It takes pictures. It flies around. And you can do all kinds of cool things with it. But it can also be very dangerous. And uh, 
a lot of those drones have propellers, and I hope it hasn't happened to any of you here, but uh, if uh, you accidentally put your finger on a propeller, it can, it can cut you pretty bad or hurt you uh, severely, and don't do it, uh, but it, it can hurt you a lot. Uh, that's propeller hitting your finger, but think about that drone flying to a person, that will hurt them even worse. And think about that drone flying to a car, it will damage the car. Well, we have airplanes, we have civilian airplanes that are carrying hundreds of passengers, and we also have our military airplanes that are doing the job of keeping us safe that uh, drones may run into and damage. Uh, these same drones, depending on how big they are, they could damage uh, windows or a whole building if it's big enough. Uh, and that is all the dangerous side of these cool, cool drones that we have around. Well, bad guys know this, and bad guys are thinking about using drones uh, to do a lot of damage, and so we're trying to stop them. And we've tried to come up with different ways to stop them. We'll tell you about three ways really quickly here. Uh, first way is kinetic, uh, which just uh, I'll explain that. Then next way is directed energy or lasers. Uh, and last method I'll tell you about is electronic warfare, electronic attack. So kinetic, what does that mean? Just like it sounds, you hit it. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. So we have two ways of doing it. Uh, we have explosive kinetics where uh, we try to hit it uh, with a bullet or something that explodes. And I've gotten to do some really cool testing here at Edwards where we're blowing drones out of the sky. And that's pretty awesome work. That it, uh, and then another way, uh, if you don't want to damage the drone, is you could try to capture it. So uh, we shoot nets at it so that it gets wrapped up in its propellers and it's trying to fly, but it's all tangled up and it can fly and it comes tumbling down to the ground. But sometimes you don't want it tumbling down to the ground because underneath where it's at, there may be people or buildings that you don't want it to fall on. So uh, we have other drones, bigger drones with nets that go to shoot it, capture it, and then drag it to wherever we need it to be. And uh, those are some of the cool testing, kinetic testing I've done in counter UAVs. Next are lasers. So some of you may have small lasers at home uh, that shoot red or green lights that can hurt somebody if you point it in their eye, for example. Well, we have bigger, much bigger lasers that burn holes through things. And so we are using those lasers to aim at these drones as they're flying about the sky and we're burning holes in them, smoking them out of the skies. And I've gotten to do some cool testing with that. And then the last way I'm gonna tell you about today for counter UAV uh, systems is through electrical attack, electronic attack or electronic warfare, which are kind of like death rays. So, uh, death rays are kind of these things that look like guns uh, that have antennas on them and shoot these invisible rays at uh, whatever electronic device that you're trying to attack. And uh, we developed that technology, seems magical, but a guy called uh, James Clerk Maxwell, about 100 years ago, came up with these Maxwell equations that we use now to build these invisible rays to shoot drones out of the sky. And I've gotten to do some of that work here at Edwards Air Force Base, and it's been a lot of fun. But uh, getting to do all these cool things, blowing drones out of the sky, that's not the best part of my job. The best part of my job are the contributions I get to make to creating the future for all of us. And that's what I enjoy most about my job. And the second best part of my job are the contributions I'm making towards uh, improving the lives and the tools that our warfighters have to keep them safe so that in turn they can keep us safe. Uh, and I hope uh, you will join me one day in doing all this cool science, technology, and engineering work. And I have a little bit of advice for you on your road to getting there. So I want you, uh, starting right now, to start developing these skills uh, in three areas. So I want you to work on your mind, on your hands, and on your teamwork skills. So for your mind, I want you to go out there, learn all the science, all the math you can hold in your head, all the time tables, all the geometry, all of those, you will need those. I use those every day to do my job. You will need them. And then I want you to work on your hands. I want you to go out there and practice designing and building things, uh, build Legos, help out around the house. If your parents are fixing the, changing the light bulbs or even working on the car, anything you can do to use your hands to develop those skills, I want you to go out and do that. And last, I want you to work on your teamwork skills because everything we do here at Edwards Air Force Base, at the center of the aerospace testing universe, is bigger than any one individual can do. And science and technology and engineering and math in general, the things we do that we accomplish are bigger than any one individual. And it takes teams and it takes teamwork to do that well. So I want you to go out and start practicing your teamwork today. 
Well, thank you for having me. I'm Richard, Richard Agbeyabur, uh, and it was great talking to you. And I'll take any questions you may have. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for that presentation. Thank and you, we Kayla. do have a few questions. Yeah. So a question that I like to ask all the speakers is, what is your favorite aircraft? Ooh, my favorite aircraft. Oh, man. I have to say it is the B-2. Um, I love the oh, flying the flying wing. I mean, there's nothing like it. Um, growing up, uh, I was, this is going to sound a little conky, but when I see birds flying, I get jealous uh, because they can just unfold their wings and fly. And the B-2, to me, when flying, looks most like a bird. I love the B-2. That is my favorite aircraft. I have to agree. <laughs> uh, next question is, what invention or technology do you want to most see implemented? Oh, yes. So it is coming uh, to a garage near you very soon. We're calling them orbs. These are electric vertical takeoff uh, and landing aircraft. These are flying taxis that you may have seen in the Jetsons and we are working on them, and they're coming right here to Edwards Air Force Base for flight tests. We are working on flight testing, flying taxis, uh, and they're coming very, very soon, and I'm very excited to own one so that I can uh, pull it out of my garage and take off vertically, and it will take me all the way to work and land, and that will be awesome. I'm looking forward to that. And I agree. That would be pretty awesome, a flying taxi. And next question is, how long have you been in the Air Force? And I know you talked about what you enjoy most about your job, but what do you enjoy most about being here at Edwards Air Force Base? So I've been in the Air Force for eight years now, and I've been stationed in four different places. And I've gotten to Edwards two years ago, and Edwards has been my favorite so far. Uh, the people I get to work with here at Edwards are just wonderful, amazing, just talented individuals. And uh, the people are what make my job most enjoyable. It is learning from them and sharing what I've learned with them that makes it enjoyable. And we do crazy things over here, and it takes a special kind of person to take on that challenge. And now we have time for one more question, and it is, did you ever want to be a pilot growing up? I am a pilot. I am not a military pilot. I am a civilian pilot. So I fly uh, small airplanes out. Uh, out of Lancaster Airport, uh, William J. Foxfield Airport. And uh, I do that on, on the side for a hobby. And it's a lot of fun uh, getting to uh, kind of unfold your wings in a way with, uh, with a motor and a fixed wing, of course, but uh, getting to fly and soar and get to see the beauty of the Antelope Valley from the skies is really quite amazing. And uh, I flew uh, last weekend, and uh, hopefully I'll get to fly again this weekend. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time and being able to speak to all these students and hopefully they were able to pick up some good tips and advice for pursuing a career in STEM. And now we'll be heading to our NASA educators for our next lesson. Awesome. Oof. Okay, James, you're live. So okay. can I share now? Uh, just one second, James. Uh, that's not my video. I, I cannot see my face on my, in the screen. Okay. So hello, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here at the Airspace Valley Air Show. We would like to thank Edwards Air Force Base for 12 Test Wing for this great opportunity to connect with you. My name is Monique Uribe, and I'm the Armstrong Flight uh, Research Center Specialist. And it is a pleasure to, to me to introduce today's presentations, my colleague from the California Office of STEM Engagement Team, James Bithra. Thank you, James. Thank you, Monica. Thank you for the introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is James, uh, and I work for uh, Ames Exploration in Canada. I'm the senior lead. And today I'm here to kind of uh, uh, talk to you about uh, Smart Sky, uh, how air traffic work in daily basis. We're gonna look at some uh, some videos and then we're gonna uh, uh, show you where to get the app out, how to play the game. So I'm about to share my screen. All right. So what is a smart sky? A smart sky is, uh, what is a smart sky? 
A smart sky is developed by NASA. A smart sky is a, uh, is a middle school in, uh, mathematics program that teaches students about the challenge that uh, air traffic control uh, experience every day. Student skills in science and technology, engineer and math are put to the test as they model, navigate analysis and resolve air traffic uh, conference using a, a side hand uh, experiment and game simulation. Using in the classroom, you guys can use this in the classroom, using it in the classroom for over a decade. SmartSky continues to be a successful program for teachers in various learning environment. The SmartSky's air traffic control and simulator website has received over uh, 250,000 student visits, although they're popular, uh, popular uh, professional development activity. The SmartSky's uh, pro project team has trained over 3,000 educators. SmartSky's also offer a compassion game app called Set that three three three, which I'll tell you about today. So we uh, re do some research and we try to find out uh, what video is out there to show you guys uh, to kind of get familiar with the smart sky. And hopefully, you guys at the end of the, this presentation, you guys will have a chance to kind of download the app. It's free, and you can be able to play in your own time. So if we can go to video number one, please. Can we go to video number one, please? Line up with math, which we're going to be talking to you about today, obviously, um, is a problem-based activity for learning. And the activity that it's based on is air traffic control. And we're going to show you how the real math that controllers use is also the real math that middle school students have to know and, and can use. And so we'd like to start off by just introducing you to air traffic control and showing you how interesting it can be. Um, the skies are pretty busy, as all of you know, but you really don't have a good feeling for how busy they are until you see all the flights in the U.S. in one day, across the map, condensed down into a two-minute animation. So this animation is going to move pretty quickly. It'll give you a wonderful feeling for what air traffic controllers have to do. So here we go with the video. Welcome to a day in the life of air traffic over the U.S. We start by looking at the air traffic at 7 p.m. East Coast time. You can see that the airspace is populated with aircraft across the country. Before long, the skies gradually begin to clear. Most of the remaining flights are the red eyes headed east. Watch Memphis and Louisville. Around 4 a.m., FedEx and UPS send out their packages. Then the East Coast wakes up. The wave of traffic works its way west across the time zones. The number of aircraft in the sky peaks at about 5,000. Altogether, there are roughly 40,000 commercial domestic flights per day, providing service to over 2 million passengers. Wasn't that amazing? I mean, it's the number of flights and how fast they build up and, and, and move across the country. It's amazing. And students really find this incredibly engaging and they understand what the basic problem is. Why aren't these planes flying into one another? How does it work? They think that pilots look out the window, but we, of course, know they don't do that. Air traffic controllers do this. And so that's what Smart Skies is all about. What we're going to do is students are going to learn how to make math-based decisions in air traffic control, and they're going to use a very neat air traffic control simulator that we have. It's actually a, a simulator of a specific sector of the real airspace. And what they get to do is they act as air traffic controllers. And on one hand, they, they're going to use the simulator. But on the other hand, they're going to have to use math. Because what they need to do is change the plane's routes and speeds so they don't get too close together. You saw how crowded the airspace was. But also so, so that they get there on time. That's the challenge of air traffic control. 
So what I'd like to do next is I'd like to just show you the other an overview of kind of the materials and some of the other uh, parts of our program before we get into the detail. The first thing is there's a free set of classroom materials. That's the simulator which you've seen with dozens and dozens of problems. There's student workbooks. There's many more videos as you will see in this activity that we're going to do with you here today. And there's a full set of uh, so full suite of teacher materials that, that supports you with everything that you should need to. The other thing that we're very proud of, as Miriam likes to say, because she did it, is that we're aligned to the math standards of all 50 states. It was, a, it was quite a job, and she'll tell you a little bit about that later. Proportional reasoning is, is one of the prime standards that the students will need to know in distance rate time problems, problem solving, and decision making. All right, so this, uh, this video is uh, pretty old, uh, but they, they are updated videos out there that you guys can check out. Uh, and also there are games that, you know, uh, he mentioned that you guys can uh, download and then play and then see at the given time, you see what uh, the, air, the, smart, uh, the sky look like in a given day. The commercial airline is, uh, is a very, uh, it's like a traffic jam every morning. Uh, as you got, you guys saw the the map of the United States. You saw that there's so many airplanes, and how do you do it? How do you uh, navigate through it? So the next video that we are about to show you uh, is going to show you. It's going to tell you guys where to get the app, app and it's free. You can download it in your iPad and how to play. So can we go to the second video, please? Roger, Southwest 23 to 600 knots. Aligned with NASA's STEM education mission is a newly released game app with an air traffic control theme developed for Apple iPhone and iPad devices. United 74 to 600 knots. The Sector 33 application challenges students in middle school and above to use basic math and problem solving skills. The player acts as an air traffic controller of a portion of Nevada and California guiding airplanes paths and speed to safely reach specific spots in the sky in the fastest time possible. What's been fun about working on this project is not only exploring the world of mobile apps, but tying education into the game. Students can't just video game their way through these problems and solve them correctly. They actually have to understand the mathematics. All right. So uh, again, you can find these uh, at the NASA uh, website, how to uh, just go, uh, tap in Smart Sky, uh, and then you can find where to find the app to download it at home. This is free in the classroom. Teachers can use it uh, in the classroom. Uh, students can use it at home and can play with the parents and they can play with their friends. So the app is available. Uh, it's a set of 3.3. Three. Uh, again, just go to smartsky.com uh, uh, and then you can find the app to download and it's free. So that be said, let's, uh, if we have any question, we can uh, answer those questions. All right, I guess there's no question. So Monica, if you can hear me, so our session is finished. So uh, anything else you guys want us to kind of cover, we can cover that. Hello, James. Thank you, Jess. As uh, James was mentioning, and this application is, is free for you to download. So, and this application has a lot of mathematics on it. So, um, and as well as uh, teacher guide. So the teacher guide is a good resource for you as an educator to download it. And um, and uh, they, they have five, they have four um, um, lessons. And every lesson is either you can you can work with your students as a team, and the students can uh, 
find a big room. So you have to find a big room and just uh, navigate as there were airplanes. So, and um, it is really interesting because in these activities, uh, the students visualize how to navigate, how to control the airplanes. So how to uh, use the mathematics in real world. So it's a real world application and um, it, either they can they can be um, two planes or they can be acting as a three or four up to five planes in the in the moment, and um, it, it is good because they would they're gonna visualize if they can have a collision or the times and they will calculate the distance and the time the velocity of the airplanes and pretty much they playing by learning. So uh, we really encourage you to go and uh, check the smartskies.com uh, in uh, NASA. And it's a NASA resource. As uh, we said, it is completely free. And um, plus, uh, it is really good for you to uh, uh, print out the worksheets and the students can get the data. So they just need a pencil and a worksheet, the printout of the, uh, the worksheet, and they can um, uh, analyze while they're working. They can work together or, uh, yes, at these moments, we cannot work together, right? We cannot be uh, working as uh, teams, but um, they can play at home with the family, with dad or mom. So mom can be airplane number one or Delta or um, ma ma uh, dad is gonna be um, uh, Southways and I'm gonna be, I don't know, Mexicana or I don't Mexico, something like that. So, and the good thing is that we are visualizing a step by a step how the airplanes navigate and how we can control. And we don't have to be engineers working for NASA, working for the Air Force. We don't have to be engineers to know how to control the airplanes, right? So, and um, either uh, James was mentioning, you can download the app uh, using an, um, a smartphone or your iPad or your computer. Um, so this is a good resource because it's not just talking about technology using computers, because remember, remember, technology is anything that can make the life easier. And paper and pencil is technology. So using technology in our hands give us the visualization of how to apply mathematics in real world. And uh, if we talk about uh, coordinates, we can talk about X and Y coordinates and angles. So uh, if you are a math teacher or a physics teacher, this is a good resource for you to apply in your classroom. So we really encourage you to um, utilize this resource. And um, 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 can, can I don't know if we can play the, uh, the second video, please, one more time. And, uh, and that way I can, I can explain a little bit more about the video. I don't know, we have the resource open. And also, Monica said uh, there's a level to it, so... Aligned with NASA's STEM education mission is a newly released game app with an air traffic control theme developed for Apple iPhone and iPad devices. United 74 to 600 knots. The Sector 33 application challenges students in middle school and above to use basic math and problem-solving skills. The player acts as an air traffic controller of a portion of Nevada and California guiding airplanes paths and speed to safely reach specific spots in the sky in the fastest time possible. What's been fun about working on this project is not only exploring the world of mobile apps, but tying education into the game. Students can't just video game their way through these problems and solve them correctly. They actually have to understand the mathematics. So there's also a level to it. So when you play a level one, uh, it kind of guide you to the level two. So if you do well on level one, then you'll be able to go to level two and it go up to 10 level. Again, these games is a game for you to see in a given day, how many play, planes are in the sky in a given day and air traffic control, how to make sure that all these planes get, get to their destination. So uh, it's a good uh, app activity that a classroom can use, uh, teachers, mathematics and science teachers, this is a, a great activity for you guys, for your student to learn how to uh, do air traffic control any given day in the United States.
do we have any questions? Okay, um, let me see if I can share my screen. Okay. Can I please uh, share my screen? Okay, one second, sorry. Thank you, let me share my screen. Um, let me see. Um, talking about uh, technology, right? The, the difficulties of technology. Sorry, I'm trying to get my screen share. One second, please. Thank you so much. Um, here we go. Okay, let me see. One second, one second. Okay, here we go. No, um, I don't know why I'm not able to share my screen. Um, I think because we're sharing the screen this at the same time, James. Uh, yeah, because I don't think I'm sharing right now. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sharing right now. Okay, I don't know why yeah, I'm having difficulties to share the screen, but yes. Um, let me see. Uh, Monica, you can also bring up your that document that you want to share in the screen first to so make that bigger because Zoom is a little bit different from Martin. Okay, so um, actually the the activity is an introduction to fly by math. Uh, if you look for fly by math, uh, and uh, actually it's gonna be, uh, I cannot share my screen, I don't know why it's gonna, but I can talk about it. Uh, there is physical experiment. Uh, let me see your screen, please. In that way I can, I can. And we have six math methods. We can apply six math methods. So we can change the route. We can change the speed. The students will be able to match the target time. And as, as, as um, I mentioned, this is, a, I'm a mathematician. I'm an engineer. I love math. I love physics. So this activity, actually I was playing with this activity for, I think for 45 minutes. And I said, what? Uh, it is really excited because I can see the applications now in mathematics and um, uh, we can count with feet and seconds. We can draw and stack blocks, uh, plot points on the on two vertical lines and and um, we're going to uh, graph two linear equations as well. So we talk about equations. This is a good program. We're talking about questions and visualization of the axis, X and Y axis and two dimensional axis. Uh, actually, the students will be count using their feet. And then they're gonna use conversion uh, in seconds and uh, as well as distances. Uh, we can draw and stack blocks, plot points on two vertical lines, plot points on a grid. Uh, we're going to use, for advanced students, we're going to use the, di the distance formula, which is the uh, um, uh, distance divided by the, the, the ratio, right, of the distance and the time. I don't know if I can, now I can, no, I cannot share my screen, I don't know. But, okay. Mm. Let me see if I can share now my screen. No, I cannot share my screen. I don't know. Okay. So this application applies the graphing to linear equations. So linear equations with two variable, the, the variable of the time on it. The students are gonna be able to find the distance travel and they will graph it using the distance and the time graph on the X and Y axis. Um, at the same time, the graphing visualization tool. This activity uh, each has panels, then we can change the speed and the starting position. So the students are gonna be uh, working on, they used to work in pairs, but now they can work individually and uh, analyze the time that they need to go into the target. And this, this um, uh, uh, app, takes place around the area of California, actually. So um, they're driving around Modesto, California, 
and uh, using several uh, airlines uh, uh, in the area. Uh, a change in one panel changed the other two panels and help the students link the math to the real work, which is really important because always as a math teachers, we always get in the question, when we're going to be using mathematics in real world, right? So uh, are we crashing or not crashing? This is the question that we will ask when we are applying this, uh, this activity. No, I cannot share my screen. That one, okay. We can use the simulator to answer these questions. When the lines cross on the graph, do the planes collide? Because they able they, the students will be able to see if the lines are crossing or not. If they're crossing, obviously we will crash. So and then using the we can apply the engineering design process and we talk the previous days and we said, okay, if the lines are crossing, what can I improve uh, to make it easier or to make it no crash? No crash. One of the graphs, the lines intersect at, for example, 30 comma 15. So that's mean X and Y coordinates. This is a real good and a real, real good tool to um, um, apply the mathematics. At 30 seconds, uh, each plane 15 feet from each, uh, each root. Um, so the planes are on two routes that intersect at 20 feet. That's, the, that's how we can read it. On the graph, the lines again intersect at 30, uh, 30 meters and 50 feet. Or it, w This is a good tool to uh, exchange the uh, units of measurement. We challenge. For two planes on two routes, configure the graph to represent a collision. And they can give you hints. For example, where is the only place on the route a collision can occur? So if you want to go to Flyway Mat, go to www.smartskies.nasa.gov 